I think we can start, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah, let me introduce, sir. Good evening, students, uh, my colleagues, and uh, uh, Dr. Arun. Uh, so, welcome here to the platform of the JST undergraduate. With due respect to my mentor, Professor Vinay Kapoor, and the initiator of this wonderful teaching platform, Online One, uh, the JST UG with the intention of selfless teaching program for the undergraduate MBA students from the entire country. Also, thanks to Dr. Avinash and team Dwarka Clinic and team for providing a wonderful platform, online platform for this program. Good evening, we have with us Dr. Arun Kumar Goel, uh, Senior Director of Surgical Oncology, especially Breast Oncology from Max Super Specialty Hospital, Delhi, who has trained himself uh, in uh, AIMS uh, Delhi in the hospital. And okay, he has like. publications in the national and the international peer-reviewed journals. So he'll be a wonderful speaker today and the yeah, students, I yeah, hope you all to just uh, get the maximum benefit. And the topic of discussion today is approach to a case of uh, breast lump, which is a major topic, uh, especially for the undergraduate students, you know, especially for the long case, short case, as well as theory. So you cannot ignore a breast lump. Hello, uh, very good evening to all of you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Prakash, for this nice introduction. And uh, uh, I must add. first interaction on this platform and i would also like to express uh, my thanks and gratitude to dr vinay kapoor uh, uh, so that we don't have the is it possible just let me sir communicate to them sir the, there are some extra noises from this uh, dr no, no, no. Please mute all of you. Laptop, please. Or mobile phone. Please mute all of you. Please. You are all disturbing to us. Somebody in the Galaxy M30, please mute yourself. And Samsung SM. Please, all of you mute. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Vinay Kapoor. Uh, is my senior from AIMS. Uh, I have known him from the time I was an undergraduate student in the early 80s. So it's uh, nearly 40 years ago that I first came in touch and he was a role model for us, very academically oriented and he's taught us. So it is no surprise that he's taken the initiative to sort of get a team together and organize this uh, online teaching platform. Uh, this online te uh, teaching and learning is one thing which COVID has given us and I believe it is here to stay and it is going to enrich the medium of exchange for all of us. So straight away I will come to the topic how to approach a breast lump. Now a breast lump is a very common clinical presentation whether you are an undergraduate, whether you are a postgraduate in surgery or whether you are a specialist in the field of oncology. Uh, again. Okay. Yeah. So, the way I am going to discuss this topic, you will have uh, an approach which is basically coming from the perspective of a surgical oncologist. So, it is possible that when uh, general surgeon talks about this topic there will be uh, some differences as an oncologist my priority first and foremost is to make sure that we never miss a malignancy and i believe that that has to be the priority for everybody who sees a breast lump whether as a general surgeon whether as an undergraduate student or whether as a surgical oncologist or a breast surgeon So, 
what is the philosophy and i said first and foremost or the primary objective is do not miss a cancer uh, so i can say that normally uh, if we take the example of indian penal code indian penal code says that uh, no innocent should be punished while guilty may escape but when it comes to handling a breast lump the objective is actually reversed you may actually suspect 15 20 cases of maybe harboring a cancer and finally only one may turn out to be cancer but our objective is not to let a cancer pass under our hand without diagnosis in addition to this we should also be willing to address the fear and concerns of the patient because many times when patients uh, they feel that they have a breast lump one of the biggest fears in their minds is whether they are having cancer so as a treating doctor it is our responsibility to take care of this fear or concern also even if there is a cancer we can take care of the anxiety associated with the diagnosis and if there is no cancer then we can reassure the patient that there is no cancer uh in addition to this we need to find pathologies which may not be cancerous but which we need treatment we also need to identify if the patient has a benign pathology that can be safely washed or managed conservatively so we do not do unnecessary surgical intervention and at the same time when women are coming to us with breast related symptoms that is an opportunity for us to sensitize them to breast health guide them about regular breast self examination this sensitization for breast health and breast self examination are very important initiatives when it comes to improving early diagnosis of breast cancer in the society uh i believe uh, we can have question answers at the end of the presentation in between if there are any questions that you would like to post you can post them in the chat box also okay uh now coming to this uh, what are the different possibilities when a patient presents with a breast lump so there is a long list of pathologies this list has been taken from this book called Harris Lipman Morrow and Osborne by diseases of the breast fifth edition so i will not go over this whole list but just highlight some of the important causes so breast lumps that can be or are malignant could be invasive carcinoma of the breast now invasive carcinoma is a broad group pathologically the biggest group which we call invasive carcinoma is nowadays described as the invasive carcinoma nst or nos that means no specific type or not otherwise specified previously people used to pathologically label it as invasive ductal carcinoma but nowadays the term is invasive breast cancer or invasive carcinoma of breast nst or nos in addition to this we have a number of other subtypes the most common is invasive lobular carcinoma which may form 10 to 15% of cases and then other much less common subtypes like tubular mucinous medullary metaplastic etc then we can have a in situ cancer which is ductal carcinoma in situ here it is ductal carcinoma in situ because lobular carcinoma in situ is not classified as a malignancy it is basically a pre malignant or a risk indicating lesion then we can have fibroepithelial lesions which are fillers tumors which may be malignant or sort of borderline or benign tumors then we have other primary lesions in the breast which can be uh, mesenchymal tumors hematological tumors like lymphomas and all and less commonly we can have metastatic lesions in the breast from other sites also then other common causes of breast lumps which are not malignant would be fibroadenoma which would definitely be the commonest breast cysts are also very common things other than this there can be cystic lesions which are related to lactation which are galactoseals then breast abscesses can sometimes present as breast lumps then we have a pathology called as idiopathic granulomatous mastitis in which the changes are granulomatous but there is no confirmation or diagnosis of tuberculosis but in a country like india definitely tuberculosis is a possibility and we see cases of tuberculosis from time to time and they can present with breast lumps fat necrosis is another pathology which is particularly seen in 
women postmenopausal women and then there can be other pathologies like hematomas lipoma etc there are certain lumps which the patient presents as a breast lump but may not be actually breast lump so patients may have lymph nodes in the axilla which the patient says i am having a breast lump then there are lesions of the breast skin a uh, common one being sebaceous cyst and there can be other lesions related to the skin or skin at nexa accessory breast tissues in the axilla can also sort of patients may present that they have a breast lump in the axillary lesion then sometimes patients say that they have a lump but on examination you do not find a lump and you find a diffuse nodularity of the breast this is often related to having a sort of dense breast tissue or a terminology which is sort of fairly obsolete fibroadenosis but uh, there are lot of different descriptions uh, these are related to the endocrine or hormonal changes which occur in the breast uh, with the regular menstrual cycles then sometimes a patient may feel there is a lump and this is related to basically the way the patient palpate and often we say that if you use your thumb and finger together and then breast tissue between them may feel like a lump while there is no lump so it is always uh, recommended that when you have to look for a breast lump use the flat of the hand usually the flat of the four fingers rather than between the thumb and the finger okay so now coming to what happens when a patient with a breast lump presents to us in the opd how do you assess so for all patients with breast symptoms there are three important things this is actually uh, going a bit on the dramatic side but i think this highlights the importance of this approach this approach which is called as triple assessment which forms the core of how you address a breast lump and other breast symptoms also so what is triple assessment so triple assessment basically is a combination of clinical assessment imaging and pathological assessment and leads to a definitive diagnosis generally the sequence is a clinical assessment first followed by imaging followed by pathological diagnosis or pathological assessment pathological assessment and imaging are carried out as indicated after the clinical assessment so clinical assessment basically includes a detailed history and definitely a thorough examination when we talk of a detailed history uh generally history taking uh, there are standard uh, sort of guidelines about what you ask in history but uh, let us say we talk about duration so duration of the lump for any lump is critical uh whether it is in days in weeks in months or rarely in years so a breast lump which has been present for say 2 3 4 years without any changes in size is generally likely to be benign but i would like to say that sometimes patients may have a history which can confuse so we rarely see a woman who may have a breast lump for say 1 year or 2 years which has not shown any significant increase in size this may happen in elderly women which have a very slow growing cancer so generally you cannot rule out a possibility of cancer based on a say duration of 6 months 12 months or longer but still duration gives you an indication of what it could be something which has developed in one or two days then you have to think of maybe some sort of a infectious pathology something which is there over a short period of maybe a few weeks a malignancy could be a possibility something longer than that then definitely fibroadenoma and other pathologies hmm then onset how did it sort of how did it manifest whether suddenly it started with pain or patient uh, sort of uh, how did the patient come to notice so generally pain or heaviness in the breast suddenly again suggests a sudden onset in addition to this what has been the course of the uh, symptom whether the patient has a static course in the sense that there is no change in size there is a progressive course that the lump has been regularly continuously increasing in size again the duration over which this has happened is important 
and is there any period in which the lump have actually reduced in size a significant reduction or maybe total disappearance so sometimes breast cysts which are related to fibroadenosis they fluctuate in size they may even totally disappear they may have a relation to the menstrual cycle also then associated symptoms so one of the important associated symptoms definitely is pain again pain is not a very a uh, sort of it cannot specifically hint at a diagnosis but a sudden onset with pain and fever would suggest that a infectious pathology is there a uh, sudden onset uh, with pain but no fever it could be a cyst if uh, there is no pain it can be a carcinoma or a fibroadenoma and so on then associated symptoms generally we have to ask for history of systemic symptoms so systemic symptoms are important when it comes to the uh, cancer and the possibility of metastatic spread so in breast cancer usually the common sites are lung liver bone and less commonly brain so we generally ask for metastatic symptoms related to these sites when it comes to lung then we may ask for cough chest pain breathlessness when it comes to liver there may be pain in the upper abdomen heaviness loss of appetite weight loss weakness when it comes to bony spread then there can be uh, sort of bone pain localized to a particular site usual site of metastasis are the axial skeleton so spine hips uh, and the shoulder girdle ribs these are common sites of metastatic disease so persistent pain if there is a metastasis in the spine with cord compression there may be symptoms of cord compression with weakness loss of sensation bowel or bladder symptoms so all those we have to check for brain metastasis definitely there are neurological symptoms which may be headache vomiting motor and sensory symptoms related to brain metastasis and all again when it comes to breast lumps and breast cancer and other pathologies menstrual history is critical because in breast cancer we know that endogenous hormones play a very important role so the history of when the menarche happened whether the patient is menopausal or not premenopausal perimenopausal then uh, whether there is pain in the breast related to menstrual cycle if there is any irregularity in menstrual history all those are relevant some of them are relevant in relation to risk factors for breast cancer some of them are relevant when it comes to the future management of breast cancer some of them like mastalgia and cyclical mastalgia may be very important for making a diagnosis when it is not malignancy obstetric history again is relevant when it comes to the risk factors of cancer nulliparity is a risk factor for breast cancer late first childbirth again is a risk factor for breast cancer in contrast early first childbirth lactation they reduce the risk of development of breast cancer then again this history may be relevant when a patient has been diagnosed with cancer and you are planning treatment then fertility is an important consideration in relation to the treatment contraceptive history there is some sort of relation to the use of oral contraceptives but this is a minimal effect it used to be more significant when the older generation of contraceptives were used but other than contraception uh, there is also the use of post menopausal hormonal therapy again something which was in fashion about 20 30 years ago and has the usage has significantly reduced family history becomes a very critical component when it comes to breast cancer so because 10 to 15% of breast cancer cases have associated uh, sort of history of breast or ovarian cancer or other cancers like male breast cancer prostate cancer pancreatic cancers and other so th- it depends upon the type of inherited uh, genetic defects and also getting a good family history which covers both the maternal and paternal side and at least uh, two generations is important to look at whether the patient has any predisposing factors from family history then personal history whether the patient has other medical illnesses what is the occupation what are the personal habits all these are very important okay so examination some basics that uh, chaperon should be there 
and this is absolutely critical for uh, male uh, doctors but women doctors should also preferably have a chaperone good lighting make the patient comfortable avoid cold hands and for complete examination bare torso is important so we should ensure adequate privacy and explain the need for this to the patient so that the patient cooperates primary components in breast examination are inspection and palpation generally we like to use sitting position and lying down position but in addition some of the examination has to be done bending forward we also ask the patient to raise the limbs and uh, so those provide additional information comparing both breasts is critical so we look at size shape whether there's any distortion in shape nipple whether the nipple position is higher on one side any distortion in shape of the nipple nipple retraction skin changes skin changes can be skin tethering skin infiltration ulceration satellite nodules pudi orange or orange peel appearance of the skin prominent veins may be there particularly in cases of uh, cystosarcoma which is large or malignant then we should examine the lump in detail which has to be the size of the lump shape of the lump location of the lump when it comes to location or uh, uh, size all these what we have to describe is generally use a clock face for description so for both breasts we have to describe whether the lump is in say one is a quadrant approach in which we can say upper inner quadrant upper outer quadrant lower inner quadrant lower outer quadrant or we can say a clock says 12 o'clock 1 o'clock 2 o'clock 3 o'clock what has to be realized that 3 o'clock for right breast is a inner area while 3 o'clock for the left breast would be a outer area so this is something which has to be kept in mind so when we say there could be a lump let us say which is 3 cm in size which is from 2 to 4 o'clock which is located say 4 or 5 cm away from the border of the areola the overlying skin is free the lump is free over the underlying pectoral muscle limited mobility outline irregular so these sort of descriptions are important and they should be properly recorded because all this information is important one to sort of assess from time to time take treatment decisions and all assessment of the axilla and supraclavicular area axilla in particular one for the lymph nodes and secondly the axillary tail of the breast so sometimes actually breast cancers are found only in the axillary tail the primary is in the axillary tail and not in the other parts of the breast and supraclavicular lymph node metastasis can happen sometimes in tuberculosis you may find lymph nodes when there is metastatic tumor in the breast there could be something in the supraclavicular area so all this has to be uh, sort of assessed and recorded in detail broadly when uh, so you have done a assessment so you could have after history and physical examination no abnormality so you could reassure the patient they may be just uh okay. uh some generalized thickening or nodularity again it may not be suspicious we can ask the patient to sort of come back to us after some time or we may ask for imaging depending upon the detailed history family history and other factors sometimes we feel that it is a benign mass we go for imaging with or with and may not need a pathological assessment but usually if there is even slight suspicion then imaging and pathological assessment are carried out so when it comes to breast imaging the three common uh, investigations are x ray mammography breast ultrasound or sonomammography and magnetic resonance imaging or mr mammography in addition to this we have breast scintigraphy pet ct and elastography which are not very commonly used so i will just talk a little bit about the first three uh overall what we can say is that ultrasound and x ray mammography they form the backbone of breast imaging and mr mammography is the advanced imaging approach which is used as a supplement to these uh, two some important things usually we ask for imaging of the both breast at least when it is being carried out for the first time 
in addition to this there is something called as the berat system i'll talk about it a little later also which is for standardization of reporting and communication experience of the radiologist high quality imaging so high quality imaging needs good quality equipment and following standardized protocols experienced radiologist are critical and nowadays breast imaging has become a sort of sub specialization and we have a large number of uh, radiologists specializing in the field of breast radiology so when we come to x ray mammography basically it's a soft tissue x ray imaging technique usually low dose imaging is there so the dose which is delivered to the breast is very very low it is done using compression plates to immobilize the breast and thin the parenchyma which is imaged at one position so it overall improves resolution and imaging quality so there have been a sort of evolution in mammography technology what used to be common about two decades earlier is what is called as a analog mammography overall there is a move towards digital imaging and that has happened in the field of mammography also the, the standard is called full field digital mammography and we can say as of today this is the standard of care when it comes to x ray mammography but definitely there are many centers where still analog mammography may be in use but any new center which comes up should install a full field digital mammography there is a advantage to digital mammography because the image can be manipulated on the screen with the adjustment of the contrast and a digital imaging also allows the use of ai technology which is being evaluated quite strongly for uh, assessment of mammography images the next uh, progression has happened with what we call as breast tomosynthesis or 3d mammography this is a uh, slight variation on uh, tomographic scanning of the body so here we create tomographic images of the breast so this provides some advantage when it uh, is a case of dense breast parenchyma i'll talk about breast density a little later then we have another approach called contrast enhanced mammography which can provide uh, information about the blood supply of the pathology within the breast and can be a alternate to mri so mammography is a radiation exposure it can be an issue in younger women and there is a cumulative exposure particularly if women are having regular screening mammography so generally we tend to avoid the x ray mammography in young women there is also loss of sensitivity if the breast parenchyma is dense and it cannot differentiate between solid and cystic lesions but it is highly sensitive for calcification so x ray mammography is the most sensitive approach for micro calcifications and ultrasound and mri have a significantly lower or very poor sensitivity when it comes to micro calcification now coming to ultrasound or sonomammography high frequency probes are important so they should not be done using low frequency probes generally it is a minimum of 7.5 megahertz or higher maybe 10 11 also nowadays we have a variable frequency probes also in addition doppler imaging can be combined to assess the vascularity of the lesion elastography is an extension of ultrasound assessment in addition we have something called as a contrast enhanced ultrasound which can improve so there are some ultrasound contrast approaches including micro bubbles and all which can improve the results of ultrasound but not very commonly used another technique called automated breast ultrasound has been described but primarily for breast screening not for symptomatic lesions the advantage of sonomammography there is no radiation exposure it differentiates between solid and cystic lesions and it is can be in fact superior to x ray mammography in women with dense parenchyma and often so is used as a complementary modality another advantage of ultrasound is that it provides real time guidance for interventions like ultrasound guided biopsy or marker placement so overall if we come to ultrasound and mammography we can say that for young women generally below 35 or 40 years of age we use ultrasound as the first investigation generally women above the age of 40 either we use mammography as the first investigation or we use a combination of ultrasound and mammography 
for younger women if there is a strong suspicion of cancer so mammography can be carried out in addition to ultrasound but otherwise if the suspicion of malignancy is not strong we avoid x ray mammography when it comes to x ray mammography the basic approach is what we call as a bilateral two view imaging which is a sort of craniocaudal images for both sides and there is something called as a mediolateral oblique imaging so mediolateral oblique imaging increases the coverage of the breast parenchyma so this is a absolute minimum whenever a patient is advised mammography for the first time you should look that it is bilateral and both views have been done for both breasts and then there are uh, parameters which are used to judge the standard so we look at uh, the outline of the pectoral muscle we look at here the sort of in the depth a little bit of the pectoral muscle imaging is there so medial and lateral uh, coverage should be complete sometimes in large breast multiple images may be required to cover the whole breast in addition after this four uh, views have been carried out if there are any abnormalities we can look for additional views which are spot compression magnification extended craniocaudals bilateral medial mediolateral direct views and there are special views for women with breast implants now coming to breast density this is become a very important uh, parameter now for description in mammography so breast can vary from almost entirely fatty to extremely dense so it is these two groups of heterogeneously dense and extremely dense where we have to be concerned about loss of sensitivity and missing out on malignancies so these are also described as acr a b c d and as i mentioned previously also c and d are definitely ones where we are more concerned about missing lesions what is berads berads is today a standard of care when it comes to breast imaging so it is co called breast imaging reporting and data system berads it is uh, a system which has been developed by the american college of radiology team of experts currently in the fifth edition and we have versions of berad for x ray mammography berad for ultrasound berad for mri and the success of this approach of berads has definitely led to the development of similar systems for liver which is called lirads or for lung imaging for prostate imaging and all and so gradually we are going to have standardized approaches for reporting for a lot of different body areas so this helps in improving communication interpretation and clinical decision making so berad system there is a category called category 0 and other than that we have categories 1 2 3 4 5 and 6 category 0 does not mean normal category 0 basically means that uh, the radiologist doesn't find the mammography images sufficient for reporting and they say that additional imaging required often it happens in cases of dense parenchyma or then we have category 1 which is basically normal breast category 2 there is some abnormality but which is benign according to the radiologist interpretation then category 3 again is something which is probably benign but these are cases where there may be some concern so in many of these cases there is a short interval follow up and if on short interval follow up there is no change this may be downgraded to category 2 now coming to Four and five. So five is highly suspicious of malignancy, and four is suspicious of malignancy. But the range of suspicion varies from two to ninety-four percent. While for five, it is ninety-five percent and above. So four has been subdivided into four A, four B, and four C. The risk varies according to this: four A, two to nine percent, ten to forty-nine, and fifty to ninety-four. but what is important is for all these three categories here and for category 5 tissue sampling is mandatory you cannot leave only thing is sometimes one radiologist has reported 4a so suppose you have x ray mammography saying 4a you might combine a ultrasound and then see if the two together support a possibility of 4a or you may downgrade it to 3 so based on that once you combine modalities also and you think it is 4a then you go ahead with tissue sampling category 6 is basically when the lesion is already biopsy proven and then uh, mammography has been carried out after that 
showing some images. So this is the ultrasound showing a clear face. This is a fibroadenoma, which is basically a over lesion with a hypoechoic changes. There is a concept in reporting which is called as wider or taller or parallel or anti-parallel. So generally a lesion which is say parallel to the pectoral muscles is called as a wider rather than taller. So this one is called as a, this is the width and this is the height or tall. So this is wider than taller. In contrast, we have here is a lesion which is irregular and also tall. So this is taller than wider and irregular. So this is strongly suspicious of malignancy and this is very well defined overall uniform ecogenicity and all. So here on the other side we come here there is a lesion which is a mixed solid cystic lesion. So we have a cavity with a intracavitary papillary lesion. So here again it is lesion lesion. And here we have a axillary imaging showing a axillary lymph node, which is a typical kidney bean shape with a hilum ecogenicity. So there are parameters which are yes. to be uh, Which may be the size of the lymph node, cortical thickness, uh, fatty hilum, vascularity, all these things have to be looked. Then X-ray mammography that showing a fibroadenoma combined with the ultrasound then there's some oil cysts are there calcified fibroadenomas these are typically benign calcification then this is a cancer a very dense outline irregular shape distortion of the parenchyma distortion of overlying skin another case of breast cancer coming to mr mammography so MR mammography is indicated not as a routine investigation. It can be when a patient needs uh, breast cancer has been diagnosed and surgery is being planned, particularly breast conservation surgery. When diagnosis is not clear after mammography or ultrasound, you need to have better assessment. Can be used for screening in high-risk women. It can be used for assessment or response to neoadjuvant chemotherapy and for assessment in women who have breast implants. Some basic principles of MR mammography, it is basically an imaging which is done in prone position. A 1.5 Tesla MRI machine is required. You should not do it on a lower specification machine, but you do not need to go for a higher specification or 3 Tesla also. 1.5 Tesla is good enough. Dedicated breast coils are critical. MR mammography should not be done on body coils. They should be done on dedicated with dedicated breast coils. Bilateral imaging is required. It should always be contrast enhanced and a dynamic uh, enhancement curves should be generated to look for the enhancement patterns. Diffusion weighted imaging has nowadays been added to the standard protocol when MR mammography is being carried out. If you have an opportunity to time it, then preferably in an early postmenstrual phase where the background enhancement related to hormonal changes is minimal. Now, after imaging, we come to pathological assessment. So, when we decide that pathological assessment is required, the possibilities are fine needle aspiration cytology, core needle biopsy, incision biopsy, and excision biopsy. Basically, the main approach which is used or recommended is a core needle biopsy. So, I'll come to this. Why? When we come to FNAC, it has some advantages. It is a OPD procedure. It is a very simple procedure. You need a syringe needle, some glass slides, minimal patient discomfort. You don't even need to use local anesthesia and usually it can be reported very rapidly. And the cost is also very low. But there are certain disadvantages. One that you need to have a pathologist who is experienced in cytopathology reporting. So we can say that all pathologists are experts in reporting histopathology, but not all are equally good in cytopathology reporting. Then in addition to this, inadequate samples happen uh, a lot of times in fine needle aspiration cytology. So we can have false negatives because of either inadequate samples or samples from the surrounding breast parenchyma. Rarely false positives can also happen, particularly if there is ATPR, which is misinterpreted as a carcinoma. In contrast, core needle biopsy, basically you get a core of tissue with a thicker needle. 
it is highly sensitive highly specific and highly accurate there is usually no false positive false negatives are negligible specifically particularly if we do a image guided biopsy it also can differentiate between non invasive and invasive cancer which is not possible with fine needle aspiration cytology in addition the tissue which we have can be used for immunohistochemical examination and those ihc markers can help you in treatment decision making so <laughs> it is now recommended that 14 gauge uh, biopsy needle should be used but uh, if not available a 16 gauge may also be good enough a minimum of four core should usually be taken and generally when we put them in the formal insulation we see that uh, proper samples tend to fall down to the bottom while fatty biopsies tend to float so if sample is floating it is likely to be inadequate <coughs> or non representative <coughs> why do we recommend image guided biopsy so basically generally when we talk of image guided biopsy the usual approach is a ultrasound guided biopsy and which would always be possible if a patient has present presented with a symptomatic breast lump uh, other approaches mammography guided or stereotactic guided approaches are used for non palpable or screen detected lesions so why do we need image guided one that accurate targeting is possible for lesions which are small or slightly deep seated may be palpable but you cannot uh, target them accurately in a handheld biopsy approach then sometimes there are areas of necrosis or cystic area so you have to target the solid area or area without necrosis so that is also possible using ultrasound guidance so overall ultrasound guidance leads to increased sensitivity it also decreases the complication rate so as a rule in our setups nowadays ultrasound guided biopsy has become the standard of care but definitely for large lesions if ultrasound guidance is not available for uh, any center then a handheld core needle biopsy can be carried out but you should explain to the patient that sometimes there may be a sort of non diagnostic uh, possibility also so overall after we have done triple assessment we can have a finding uh, like uh, after clinical assessment it may be totally normal or we may have a benign pathology may have a fillot's tumor we have a malignancy invasive breast cancer in situ breast cancer but there is something which we need to highlight which is called discordance sometimes clinically you suspect malignancy but uh, your imaging or pathology does not uh, sort of so you do not ignore a discordant result you have to go back to either imaging or pathology okay so discordance between may be between clinician and clinical findings and radiological findings so the clinician sees something the radiologist does not see it so it may happen if the breasts are dense on mammography so i may feel a lump but the mammography may show dense parenchyma and no cancer and believe me 10 to 15% of palpable lumps may not show anything on x ray mammography sometimes the quality of mammography may not be very good or sometimes a radiologist may overlook some subtle findings so missed cancer there was a palpable lump which was labeled as a simple cyst so it was aspirated but 6 months later patient presented with a larger lump it was a papillary carcinoma in a cyst so you can see some thickening here which was a papillary carcinoma so biopsy in 2014 showed invasive ductal carcinoma a small lesion the lesion was present previously but ignored by the pathologist so another case lesion not visible on mammography not reported on ultrasound mr mammography showed a birad 5 lesion this is a extremely dense breast parenchyma where the lesion was missed but we can see here in x ray mammography and it is located dense deeply within the parenchyma 
the other could be a uh, discordance between the clinical radiological findings versus the pathological findings the radiologist and clinician think there is something but the pathologist doesn't find something so it may be if the sampling has not been done properly the sample has not been processed so sometimes it may be possible part of the sample may not have the malignancy and other part may have the malignancy so rarely there may also be a problem in interpretation so a palpable birad 4c lesion core needle biopsy fibrocystic disease but a wide excision was ductal carcinoma in c2 so how do we minimize discordance first and foremost is being alert to the possibility that discordances may be there and may be there in about 15 20% of cases then communication between the clinician the radiologist and the pathologist is very important so overall that was the broad approach to how we handle then just in very brief about the common breast lumps i'll just describe the important features but not go into too much detail and then we'll talk about the questions and uh, queries so fibroadenoma again a disease of younger women more in reproductive age group duration can vary from few weeks to few years they may grow in size but usually slow growth usually painless well defined firm oval mobile within the breast parenchyma and they have been called the breast mouse because through palpation and all you may move them from one quadrant to of the breast to the opposite quadrant also diagonally opposite pain if a patient with fibroadenoma present it may be associated with the underlying fibroadenosis or hormonal changes or cyclical mastalgia sometimes they can become very large which are called giant fibroadenomas they may be multiple they may be bilateral new fibroadenomas can develop sometimes regression also happens in young women but treatment recommended treatment usually is a surgical excision just outside the capsule of the lesion the choice of incisions and all again is something which i am not going to talk about breast cysts are again common in reproductive age group they are often associated with nostalgia fluctuation in size or total disappearance may happen when you do a ultrasound there may be multiple small cysts on bilateral uh, breast aspiration is usually carried out in the beginning but if a cyst fills repeatedly then a surgical excision may be carried out Cystosarcoma is a, again a important pathology it is a fibroepithelial lesion or tumor and it is basically a pathological spectrum where fibroadenoma lies at one end so there are two components one is epithelial one is stromal three histological categories which can be benign borderline or malignant they are usually larger in size than fibroadenoma so if a young woman presents with a breast lump which is say about 3 3 1/2 cm has a history of 2 or 3 months i would be concerned about the possibility of a cystosarcoma and usually go for a biopsy but if it's a lesion which is smaller has been present for 6 months without significant change in size i may be thinking about fibroadenomas so core needle biopsies often give you a suspicion of cystosarcoma but may not be able to differentiate between benign borderline or malignant sometimes there may be a suspicion that it could be borderline or malignant excision with 1 cm margin is the treatment of choice and then based on the final pathology report sometimes you may have to do some second surgery also breast cancer is common after the age of 40 years but 10 to 15% of cases may occur in younger age they can also be seen in 20s also so i have seen personally seen women in 23 24 25 years of age rarely people have seen at 18 19 years also so we should not rule out cancer just because a patient is young history is usually short but sometimes slow growing uh, lesions may be there with a history which is into many months or even more than a year or two years so breast lumps or breast cancers are commonly painless but presence of pain also does not rule out cancer usually the lumps are hard in consistency the outlines are sort of ill defined not very well demarcated from breast parenchyma because of the infiltrative pattern and desmoplasia and irregular outlines are there mobility is much much restricted 
it is not absolutely zero unless there is fixation to underlying structure but it is very restricted so there are additional findings like skin tethering dimpling nipple changes which may be nipple retraction or nipple ulceration there is something called as paget's disease of the nipple and areola skin infiltration over the tumor ulceration satellite nodules skew the orange or orange peel appearance axillary lymph node enlargement supraclavicular lymph node enlargement arm edema all these could be there as associated findings so i think i will stop my presentation here and then let's see what are the are there any questions on charts so i will take up here taking the question sir yeah so i will be putting up one by one so very okay. nice it is actually very concise way uh, a huge topic rather you have covered up in one hour so we will be taking up the questions which i received also in mail few of the question so one of the student has asked how the density of the breast tissue really affects the mammographic findings in young females for that reason we do the ultrasonography yes see in general one thing we have to realize is that density of the breast has two determining factors one we can there is a hereditary component to breast density in that women have a genetic makeup which can lead to a dense parenchyma but in addition to that the density of the uh, breast on mammography uh, basically is related to the composition of the breast in how much is the breast parenchyma how much is the fibrosis in that vis a vis how much is the fatty tissue so generally we see that post menopausal women there is regression of parenchyma and increase in fatty tissue so generally as the age increases after menopause there is more and more of a fatty component and the x ray mammography become shows less density so women who are in the menopausal age group they have more parenchyma less fat so generally the density is there so again if you see the density would be more in the center and the periphery subcutaneous area you see fat so that is the reason that younger women have more parenchyma because of more hormonal activity and the denser the parenchyma the chances are that any small lump or abnormality within it will be missed so mammography provides two things one there can be a contrast between the fat and the tumor and the second is microcalcification so microcalcification is something which can be seen in all cases but density may be difficult to differentiate if the mammographic density is high that is why we said in younger women one the sensitivity of mammography is low that is why we use ultrasound at first and secondly because women are young and any radiation exposure could theoretically increase the risk of future malignancy so unless we have a strong suspicion of cancer we do not do x ray mammography before the age of 35 to 40 years Yes, sir. Concept is very clear. I uh, hope the student must have uh, um, uh, just understood now. Another question is that what is the difference between F and S C and F and N S C? Ah, uh, I have not heard of this term called F N N A C. So I don't know if this. Uh, uh, if you are aware of if it means anything else or yeah, probably it is a non-aspiration cytology. That means it is just only a cytopuncture type. Means whatever uh, tissue will be, it is just a mini version of this. Core biopsy, perhaps. So we will be not aspirating that. But it is less common. Ah, uh, well, frankly, I have not really heard no, about this not. technology. So, in fact, when you do FNAC, there is some variation in the amount of suction or how many passes you make and all. So, but whether it is specifically called non-aspiration cytology, I am not really aware. So, I would not like to sort of say anything. I would say FNAC is the standard approach. but i have uh, talked about the difference between fnac and biopsy i did not talk about the other approaches to biopsy that is incision and excision biopsy normally nowadays incision biopsy is used if a patient presents with a ulcerated lesion for a non ulcerated lesion we generally don't need to do incision biopsy excision biopsy is very rarely used for cases where core needle biopsy is non diagnostic it happens very rarely so sometimes there are papillary lesions where a core needle biopsy often fails to give a clear diagnosis and we need to do excision of the whole lesion to get a pathology another question is sir what are the usual differential diagnoses 
which is often a question asked in the exam of yes. a breast lump which is clinically suspicious of malignancy. <laughs> See, if it is clinically suspicious of malignancy, so definitely invasive and non-invasive uh, breast cancers are there. Then uh, fat necrosis is a common pathology. Idiopathic granulomatous mastitis. These are things which can be confused with uh, carcinomas. They, which actually feel a hard, irregular, ill-defined lump. Uh, I'll also welcome here Dr. Pankaj, who is associate professor and is also uh, a, a trained from AIMS. So he is my colleague in my department. Okay, okay, wonderful. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Good evening, Dr. Pankaj. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah. Good evening, Dr. Pankaj. Good evening, Dr. Pankaj. All the all the relevant things in one hour. That's a very loose topic, but. And even I learned a lot of things, especially when you talk about the MRI, how to interpret the MRI, and then to be done in the wrong position. So thank you very much, sir. No, it's my pleasure. Well, definitely, as mentioned, that it's a huge topic, so I did not try to go into the details of individual pathologies. More of a broad approach. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Two more questions, sir. Uh, there, which I received in the mail, sir. How to yes. differentiate a traumatic fat necrosis on basis of history? Traumatic fat necrosis. Fat. I don't think you can differentiate on the basis of history because this is a common uh, fallacy which we face. Women come to us with a breast lump and they say that uh, the breast has been hit by a child or they had some trauma. Sometimes rural women may have that cow or animal uh, hit. But as a rule, don't take that history to make a diagnosis of fat necrosis. If you have even the slightest suspicion of cancer, the way to prove or disprove it is a thorough triple assessment. And as I said, in generally uh, women, uh, I have left out some slides which are uh, just highlighted uh, about the sort of... Uh, the possibility of cancer, we use them to talk to gynecologists about why they should be sensitive. So one of the things is if a woman say above 45 or 50 presents with a breast lump, you should think of one diagnosis that is cancer unless proved otherwise. Unless proved otherwise, think of cancer, assume cancer. So in a woman say who's 50 or 55 has a hard breast lump, even if the biopsy does not show malignancy, I would recommend excision of the lump as a final proof. Yes, sir. Definitely is the best answer. And probably one of the simplest answer can be also if it is regressive type, then probably traumatic fat necrosis can be thought of. But usually, as you told right very rightly, sir, we should go in for a triple assessment. We cannot yeah. ignore it based on the history. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. I, uh, see, it may be possible because that I am practicing as an oncologist that uh, we do not come across... Uh, Cases of fat necrosis where regression has been happening, which may be sort of more in uh, your practice. So, uh, because I have not seen women who have a breast lump and then regression has happened over a short period of time and it turned out to be fat necrosis. So, overall, what I would say is for every student, uh, the important thing is never to miss a cancer. Another question, sir. How the internal memory nodes are examined clinically? Uh, you don't uh, really get to examine internal memory nodes clinically. There may be some very rare case when a very large nodal enlargement is sort of leading to a bulge there with infiltration through the chest wall. But otherwise, there is no way to clinically examine the internal memory nodes. They are only detected on imaging. So that imaging has to be either a CT scan or a PET CT scan. Or generally, MRI is not used for uh, imaging of the chest or lungs. We use CT or PET CT. And that is the best way to image. Yes, sir. It's a nice answer because uh, sometimes what happens, uh, if we just percuss, then probably we can get. But it is only suspiciousness. Yeah, it is. Uh, it is always the radiological one, which will be most important one. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one question was, how many lymph nodes are minimum required in breast for the staging, accurate staging? Uh, so basically the internationally recommended standard has been that if a axillary dissection specimen has a report of 10 lymph nodes that has been considered adequate for 
assessment of the axilla but what i would like to say is that the whole concept of axillary assessment has undergone a sea change nowadays and for patients who have a clinically negative axilla or a ultrasound assessment negative axilla then a sentinel lymph node biopsy is the standard approach to assess the axilla it is the standard of care nowadays so every surgical training should become aware of this and it should be the practice which should be followed uh, there are lot of details related to sentinel lymph node biopsy which maybe we can think about some other uh, discussion of uh, management of breast cancers and axillary nodes but otherwise if axillary dissection you need to have a report of 10 nodes at least if it is less than 10 nodes it is considered suboptimal for a axillary dissection not for a sentinel node biopsy another question sir uh, when is a bone scan indicated is it done in all cases diagnostic carcinoma breast or is there any stage wise no bone scan is not recommended for all cases so overall when it comes to staging assessment in breast cancer we first define into clinically two categories we have early breast cancer which are basically t1 t2 tumors without significant axillary enlargement and in most of these cases you almost the global recommendations are no staging investigations so staging investigations at a minimum uh, you can do a chest x ray and ultrasound of the abdomen uh, but not absolutely mandatory what is important is if your lft shows say raised alkaline phosphatase or if patient has symptoms so in the presence of symptoms like a patient has a bone pain then you may recommend a bone scan even in a patient with a small tumor but otherwise patients who have t3 or t4 tumors or significant nodal disease they are indicate uh, indications for uh, more staging workup that staging workup can be a combination of a ct scan thorax upper abdomen and a bone scan or a whole body pet ct scan so if you are doing a whole body pet ct then a bone scan can be avoided otherwise a bone scan plus ct scan Preferably, probably stage three and stage four DGS require that. Absolutely. Case. So T three, T four, and nodal positivity. Right. So that becomes. Uh, another uh, very interesting question. Actually, how to differentiate between an inflammatory breast carcinoma from that of periorie range? Sometimes uh, the students get confused. No, I think basically there is a very clear cut definition of inflammatory breast carcinoma. So it means that a patient has a short history, less than six months. uh there is usually okay. supposed to be erythema uh, in addition to skin erythema and that edema has to cover at least one third of the breast so if this combination is there you are supposed to make a diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer so if the duration is longer if the extent of skin edema is less yes so for then you may call it pudding And the redness is not there. Okay, so we all should remember these points once again right now. These are the points which should be answered in the last two part exam. Uh, another question is that, ki, as usual, the practical question: How to differentiate what is the difference between a mortality tumor and tendering of an artery? Just a minute. Uh, what is the difference between mortality dimpling and tendering? Doctor Thapasi, can you just mute yourself, Doctor Thapasi? Yeah, we can cut this. Puckering, dimpling, and tethering. Tethering. Sometimes these words are very frequently used. Tethering. 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 See, I think broadly, मतलब this is like different terms used to describe a relatively similar finding, and basically this is infiltration of the Cooper's ligaments. so what happens is if the infiltration of the cooper's ligament is superficial area so closer to the skin so when the patient is lying down then also you may have some distortion or dimpling uh, in the uh, so so there may be slight depression or dimpling in the skin sometimes this dimpling may be visible particularly when the patient is sitting or hanging forwards so usually that is related when the tumor is slightly deeper in the breast tissue and when the breast parenchyma is hanging forward then it becomes tangible 
Yes, sir. Right, yes, sir. So, we have the special contacts to raise the hand, some of the hands. Raise the hands. Maybe we'll get those. Yes. Another student has asked uh, what is the role of the scintigraphy in case of bridge carcinoma? Scintigraphy. Yes. Uh, Scintigraphy, I just mentioned more for completion sake. Generally, we do not send a patient for scintigraphy. It is something which has been investigated, but we generally do not send a patient for scintigraphy. Okay, sir. Last question, sir. In a case of a young female, uh, maybe 16 or 17 years, and clinically sir, and also radiologically suspicious of a benign lung, maybe a fibroid number pathologically, but pathologically not tested yet. So, should we always go in for a core biopsy or FNAC can be a substitute? Uh, what I would say is there can be a situation where you decide not to do any pathological assessment. But if you want to do a pathological assessment, a core biopsy would always be better than a FNAC. So, generally, if I am looking at, say, fibroadenoma, the differential diagnosis would be a cystosarcoma. So, my, I personally believe that a FNAC is not a good investigation to differentiate between a fibroadenoma and a cystosarcoma, a core biopsy. So, if either I decide to observe the patient, maybe reassure, not do a pathological assessment, maybe call again after three months to reassess if there's any increase in size, maybe a repeat ultrasound. But if I want assessment, I would do a core needle biopsy. As I had mentioned that maybe a three centimeter or a larger lump in a young woman, which is a short history. I would straight away go for a core needle biopsy, but if it is say 1, 1 1.5 or 2 centimeter has been there for 5-6 months and uh, then maybe I could wait for some time. Yes sir, core biopsy is a minimum and uh, we should avoid FNSC in all circumstances. Uh, last question sir of the day, uh, one of them has asked uh, if it is a chemotherapy and radiotherapy indicated, which one should be given first and why? <laughs> <laughs> so, we are coming into the field of management of breast cancer. So, breast cancer management basically is, we, if we are talking of adjuvant treatment, so we are talking of surgery has been carried out, patient needs both adjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy. Today, the standard of care is chemotherapy first followed by radiotherapy. So, you complete all chemotherapy and then start radiotherapy. Generally, it is suggested that you start chemotherapy say about three weeks after surgery. And as soon as chemo is completed, within two to three weeks, you start radiation. Do not waste time here. The chemotherapy protocol should be generally finished within six months of surgery and do not delay the radiation more than six months after surgery. So, this comes to the end of the question and answer session also. It was overall very interactive one and also personally, I also learned many things from you, sir. And uh, the students must definitely have got uh, benefit from this session today. And uh, probably if there are no more questions, uh, anybody can just uh, unmute uh, themselves and ask any questions in this uh, one minute. Otherwise, we can end the session. <laughs> Dr. Praveen, actually you, you have to mute yourself. Okay. So, if there are no more questions, we have already discussed elaborately about the clinical part of the management of a case of breast lump, which is essential for the MBA students, undergraduate students. Uh, definitely, as uh, Sir told, we have not covered up the uh, management portion, which is basically required for the postgraduate level. But still, if the students are interested, we may be having a session on the management of the carcinoma breast in the future. So, Overall, it was a very interactive session and also the students must have got benefited from this. Thanks a lot, sir, for joining and giving a valuable time. Almost for one and a half hours, we have been running this session, sir. And in the future also, we will be taking your help uh, for uh, running this education program, which is, a self, which is a selfless goal of learning only. Absolutely. My pleasure. So, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. And Dr. Thank you, uh, sir. And uh, also, thank you, Dr. Avinas and Dwarka Clinic team for providing the platform for this uh, selfless goal of learning and teaching for this JSTUG. Thank you all. Good night, all of you. Thank you.